My guest today is Tracy Braben, the Labour MP for Batley and Spen. She was elected after the murder of Joe Cox during the referendum campaign. She now has got a, a portfolio within the Labour shadow administration, but she's still very much known as an actress, a former television writer, someone who has stepped away from a world we'd all quite like to to dabble in from time to time and stepped into a world most of us would like to run away from. <laughs> um, but you had very special circumstances that drew you into politics. Yeah, I mean, uh, all my life I've been a campaigner whilst being an actor. And so when um, the Labour Party needed a bit of glamour, they'd often contact sort of, uh, you know, friendly actors. And I've been uh, involved in that and also working on various campaigns and, you know, from Greenham Common, Miners Strike and so on. Um, but I'd, uh, I'd heard about Joe from my mum who said, you know, there's this amazing young woman. Uh, it's, you know, she's standing. I got, to, you know, I got more information. I contacted her and I said, you know, what can I do? Because it was your hometown. Yeah, it's my hometown, Batley and Spens, where I grew up. And, you know, my family still live. Um, and so uh, 2015 uh, into 16, obviously, we were campaigning for the uh, election. And uh, she was selected and ele elected. And then we uh, went out again for against library closures. We weren't best friends, but I got to know her and absolutely... Uh, in awe of her and her energy and her commitment to the community. And whilst we were door knocking um, in one street, she did say, Tracy, you should think about a career in politics. And that was, you know, I didn't ever think that this is where I would end up. So uh, at the uh, after the funeral, I mean, it was absolutely devastating for Batley and Spen. And uh, after the funeral, I was offering you know, what can I do to her friends and to campaigners? What, how can I help? How can, I, how can we heal? And um, one of her friends said, do you want to be an MP? And I suddenly, I just realised it's where I was meant to be. And of course, it's not a shoe in um, The other major parties stood to one side. It was only the far right and some independents that stood. So 70 people applied. Um, that was reduced to seven. Um, and we all, those seven had interviews and then two went to a hostings, the most terrifying night of my life, I have to say. Um, uh, and then there was the horrible by-election. I mean, nobody wanted that by-election, so it was really bittersweet when I won. I mean, has, has politics turned out to be what you thought? To be honest, I hadn't a clue. What I was very startled at as a by-election MP is that you're given very little support. You get uh, basically an iPad and an office. And so you're supposed to set up two offices. Uh, you have a massive budget, 140,000 or whatever. And I'd never managed anybody in my life. You know, as a freelance actor and a writer, you just look after yourself. Sorry, 140,000 pounds is what? Oh, that's all your uh, staffing costs. So your wages, your office, expenses, running your offices and that sort of thing. But given that I know I knew nothing. I will always um, thank, I'm so grateful, to the two women um, who got me going, which was uh, Sandra Major and Fazila Aswat, who worked for Jo and were there when she was killed. And they were dealing with uh, extraordinary um, uh, grief and, you know, horror at what they'd witnessed and been part of. They had the trial, but they said to me, uh, and Fazila particularly said, I don't want to do politics anymore, but I'll give you six months and I'll get you up and running. And Sandra Major was my, uh, Joe's caseworker and stayed with me as a caseworker until she retired. So I am so grateful because they just taught me everything I needed to know. I mean, I would expect in many ways you to be disillusioned and, um, you know, worried about this decision you made because you've come into politics at, you know, one of the worst times I can remember in British politics, uh, where politicians are held in very low esteem uh, by very many people. Politics is achieving very little. Um, all the parties are divided, messed up. Who knows whether the two main parties have got a future mm. as the Labour Party and the Conservative Party that we've known. Yet you don't seem that today. No, well, I mean, it's interesting because when you're an actor, everybody loves you. And as a politician, everybody hates you. And so I've had to come to terms with that, that I can't ask people to like me in the way that you can as an actor, you know, you have that relationship with an audience that's very specific. Um, but I absolutely feel every day the privilege of this job. And I, I don't know how MPs do it when they're not the MP for the hometown because it is that specific relationship that is so important that I can go around Howden Clough Estate and say to kids, I was you 
it is possible. And sometimes I, I cycle um, back to North London where I live um, half the week. And I cycle past the wheel and I look back at Westminster and I think I'm on the shadow front bench. I mean, this is an incredible journey and I'm so proud of it. Um, and, you know, I'd been an actor and a writer for 35 years and I'd achieved great success. I'd traveled the world. I've had, you know, I've got I had good agents. I, you know, I did really well. And so I think maybe it was easier to move into a new category. Tell us about childhood then, growing up mm -hmm. on, on that estate. Uh, me and my sister, my mum and dad, uh, it was, I wouldn't say it was easy. My dad was often out of work. We definitely uh, struggled. Uh, we had to give our house back, the keys to the, our house back to the building society because my dad had, was out of work. So thank goodness for the council. We got a, um, a council flat. Um, but you, you were homeless for a period, we're just you? you know for we're just waiting to get the keys and really very stressed about that and I, I even remember being very little my mum being incredibly anxious that that was going to come come off um, uh, how and, old were you um, I'm having to think I think it was about five five or six and certainly there was no necessarily no shame in it because it was a practical solution but it was um, upsetting um, and destabilizing that, you know, we, we couldn't keep our house. And my dad was a freelancer and this was always the problem because if he didn't sell, we didn't, we, he didn't earn. What, what did he do? He was selling um, uh, sewing machines uh, and then um, marble effects that you get in gift shops around uh, the north. So lo we had lots of um, Greek gods on our mantel shelf. Um, and you know, that's, that's, that's difficult. And then my mum ran a cafe in Burstall. Um, so, you know, she did an amazing job there. Um, so uh, nobody in my family had been to uni. I, I was really uh, pleased and, you know, it was great that I could get a good education at Hetman Wyck Grammar, which is also where Joe went. So was it a aspirational childhood no. I mean, that, that drove you into grammar school? And N No, no. Actually, I think a lot of it was about um, a curiosity. And so when did you decide you wanted to be an actor? Well, I, I don't even remember. It's just always been there. And I, don't, I didn't know anybody. I knew a woman who was an extra once. So you Yorkshire did school television. productions and all yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, in school, we there was an orchestra, there was a choir. I don't play an instrument and I sing badly, but anyway. Um, and we did, you know, productions every year. And it was something that I absolutely loved. Um, so drama at uni and then I, I got a place at drama school but because I'd never been to London and with no money um, I couldn't take it up it was at Webber Douglas it doesn't exist anymore um, but I, I'd been to London for the interview but then I just thought how am I gonna live and who do I know and how would I even get there and as my mother's always said don't go to that London you'll end up on the game so you know <laughs> I was always a, bit, a bit reticent about London um, so Little did she know you'd become a politician. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> yeah. uh, the similarities somewhere. Um, but so I stayed on in Loughborough where I did my degree and was one of those sad people who just didn't know what to do. And a friend just helped me out and said, come and sleep on our floor. And then I sort of got going in London. So what was the first job? Um, I worked in um, a recruitment agency, which I really loved. You change people's lives in, in that sort of work. And I worked in a bar in Hammersmith and then at Brick Lane Market on a Sunday um, uh, selling clothes. And this is while you were auditioning for things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, I hadn't been to drama school. So, um, in fact, I was walking uh, just up, up here and it, it took me back to a co-op that I started as my first ever agent. And I was with that co-op for about five years where you get jobs for each other. And it's a real um, insight in what agents want. It was really good. So you were political already then in terms of the way you were thinking? Yeah, or? I think... I really think your background informs who you are. And one turning point for me was I was at university and I had what, uh, I mean, is very rare, is a, a stranger attacked me in the street um, and he tried to rape me in the, in the street where I lived. And only through, I mean, the judge did comment on this that I absolutely fought back. Um, so, and then he ran away and a, a neighbor came up uh, further down the street. And because I'd got his number plate, um, they got him straight away, he went to court, he admitted it, and he went to prison. That is actually um, very rare, I think, for a lot of women. Um, but what that did is that completely politicised me. It made me a feminist, it made me angry, it made me question. 
um, you know, it, it made me just, why did that happen to me? You know, and, you know, why me? Why now? And actually, it was nothing to do with me. It was all about power. I can see why that would, that experience would lead you into gender and feminism mm. and male power and all of that. So where did it pull you off into the left? And oh, but no, no, no. I think if you well, come... That was already there, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think if you come from that background, the, the background that I've had, you know your, you know where you are in that... So your family were Labour, your yeah, friends were Labour, no, all no, that no, kind of No, 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 my family weren't Labour. But I, as... And I wasn't um, involved in politics at university necessarily. It was being... Uh, it was definitely the attack, but also understanding my working class roots and also... Uh, understanding as an actor, only going for parts that were working class. And, you know, I mean, I, I've said before, I never played a character that wore a suit. A big break for me was in a, a show called A Bit of a Do opposite David Jason. And they wanted the real deal, authentic, Sandra, Yorkshire, you know, working class lass. And I do remember being in um, a rehearsal period and I came in with some snacks on a tray and I said, does, uh, uh, in my, my line was, does anybody want a canal? And they were all like, oh, darling, that's so clever. Of course, that's what she'd say. I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about. It's a canap, you know. And I'm, I'm just canap uh, through and through. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I knew my place, but I also knew my box. So it really actually, in a way, was helpful because I'd got a thick accent. I've less of an accent. Well, I don't have an accent, I don't think now. I had a thick accent and I was authentically working class and hadn't had the edges rubbed off by drama school. So, you know, I, I used that as much as I could, you know, you know, authentic working class. And in a way, the work choices also made me really clarify my, my background and my identity. But also, you, you only have to be around, you know... A, the minor strike or whatever, when you know you fundraising or whatever, to know that they're getting a who who is who has got the power in these situations. You know, is it the politicians? Is it the owners of the big companies? Um, Greenham Common. I um, I spent a bit of time down there. You understand the little people trying to make big change for the for those who are at arm's reach and you know uh, are faceless you know, just making these big decisions. A, a lot of our listeners won't know what Greenham Common was. So oh, just, so bless just, them. So just, just bless tell them, us a little, I So how old were you then? That was... Oh, in my 20s, uh, so, yeah, right, early, early 20s. 20s. So, so Greenham Common was... Well, you tell us what it was about. Well, it's, it was about the Americans um, putting their cruise missiles on bases um, around the country and a group of women who um, come from a feminist tradition of direct action... Um, decided to camp outside the base. And um, I think it was a, an extraordinary... It's a, it's a bit like the uh, young people at the moment about the climate change. You know, it, it's, it's a way to do it in um, a, a wonderful way about being collective. How did you get involved in that? Did I, you just go or did you have a no, friend no, who took no. you there? No, no, no. I was... Um, I did a, a play in Christchurch in Dorset um, before I got my equity card. And I lived with a woman, Nancy, who I named my daughter after, who was very involved with the peace movement from uh, in Christchurch. In her, I'm sure she was in her late 60s, no, maybe early 60s at the time, but she's one of those sort of, um, six, you know, peaceniks, has always been a peacenik, and she took me. And we had a battered old camper van, um, uh, and just to meet women who have and made a decision to dedicate their lives to that cause, I mean, it's very um, uplifting, but also frightening. At, at one point, we were all gathered up and taken inside the base because of something we'd done. And it wasn't, you know, it was scary to be, we thought we were all going to be arrested. Um, and, and it, you, you know, you do feel that when those cruise missiles, there was a decision made, finally, um, to, to leave, you'd think, well, that's direct action, that does work. To say direct action works is, is a controversial thing because, you know... But no one was direct hurt, action, you know. No, but direct action can mean, uh, you know, a wide range of mm. things um, these days. I mean, and, and when you think about the protests that we've been having on climate change this year, um, 
You, you support all of that? Well, I... I, I you support the idea of bringing the system to I, a standstill well, to achieve I, something? Well, I absolutely think that the young people at the moment are feeling this this emergency that no one is listening to them. And it does... It seems to me that the action that they took, obviously, it impacts on business, and I'm not saying, um, you know, I'm not just being flippant, but I think that uh, the action that they took comes from a place that is deeply held closely to them, you know, that they... You'd have been there 20 years ago well, well, or 30 yeah, years ago. Yeah. That's probably true, actually. Um, that, uh, you know, it it is right that our young people particularly are heard. Do you think you could say all this if you were in government? As I've been on this journey just for a short amount of time, I can't even second guess what it must be like to be in government. Um, uh, you know, you, there are other restrictions on you if you have to have that sort of... Um, uh, group responsibility to get your message across. Um, so, obviously, uh, when you're in opposition, you have a little bit more freedom. Uh, when you are not in opposition and you're not, uh, you know, for example, people can, I don't know, the Brexit party, people can say it seems what they like because they haven't got that uh, responsibility to the team. Um, but, you know, I would hope that, that you can be as honest because I think people really want authentic um, politicians at the moment. I think they're done with spin and they're done with um, being lied to. And I think people want honesty. And if if it was difficult, I think maybe somebody, it would be okay to say, whilst I find this difficult, this is the position currently. I mean, because it, it kind of goes to the heart of what, you know, some people criticise about Labour, which is that, you know, you're, that you're effectively a protest movement. You know, that you're a, you're a bunch of people, a lot, a lot of people who like the idea of being in opposition, who like the idea of protesting, but don't really want to be in government. Oh, what I, do you think I, about that? Well, I disagree completely. And certainly in my own team in education, we are absolutely chomping at the bit to get into a position where we can change things and seeing what's happening... Uh, you know, because opposition's fun. You can shout and scream and make a fuss and all the rest, but government's difficult because you've actually got to do something. Well, it's interesting because uh, <laughs> Kevin Brennan said the other day, um, you don't mind if I swear, do you? Um, he said the thing about government, it's chicken salad and opposition's chicken shit. And I think that's the, the thing, the frustrating thing, certainly having been an MP only a couple of years, how hard it is to get things done in opposition. What I would say is you need to work with the government to get things done. Um, and the, the little wins that you have, you really can celebrate. So sometimes when a policy that is a Labour policy is taken by the government, yeah, thanks very much, yeah, please, because that'll make life better for people. And um, last year, um, uh, trying to get the 30 hours free childcare for fostered children, the government saying, oh yeah, no, yes, absolutely, we will do that. Uh, was a, a real win. I felt a high as a kite for a couple of days because you think, yes, you know, we can make a difference. But actually, the difference an MP makes in opposition, most people don't see it because it's what you do in your constituency. And having a, a great team of caseworkers particularly, that's where you can make a difference. And so getting somebody their pit back or their mobility scooter or uh, an immigration case that's really unfair or somebody in proper housing, you know, they, they, when, I, when I used to get an acting job or I got a commission for writing, I'd be really thrilled and high. And I, I actually feel that when we can change someone's life for the better. I mean, because you, you've got a slightly sort of infectious enthusiasm for what, what it is you're doing. <laughs> because, and you talk about how Joe Cox encouraged you to go into politics. Mm. What are you doing to bring, up, bring new people into politics? At a time, it's very difficult to get people interested in politics, isn't it? Well, uh, I've got a rolling program of um, uh, work experience interns. I've just had a fundraiser where hopefully I'm going to have um, a, a living wage intern in my office because we've got to grow our own. So you're actively trying to do yeah, this is what yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah. You're trying to bring in new, a new generation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look around the building and it is very frustrating. I mean, I'm very proud of the Labour Party. We have a good, great diversity and people from different backgrounds. But it's very, very frustrating about how people can even get selected and how much it costs for you to stand um, and the sacrifice you have to make and you might not even get, there might not be an election for another three years. So that we, you know, around 
the country there are passionate people campaigning for change whilst doing their day job and run, and having a family and actually having no money to, to do the campaigning but have to be on sort of a, a war footing just in case it's called tomorrow and and that's what we had with the snap general election i mean the first the first few months were incredibly difficult because as you can imagine you know following joe and people desperate to tell me about their experience of her and how hard you know how how hurt they were and so on and i did feel the imposter syndrome absolutely you know who am i this actor to to say that i can lead you i will be your champion and then the snap general election came and then it's all hands on deck um and around the country there were lots of people who may not have the, the you know be in a position to suddenly stand but just you know jumped in and, and and we did better than we thought let's go back to the first election the by-election if we can it was a nasty by-election wasn't it it was horrible um and there was a lot of far-right mm. campaigning going on on the streets because the mainstream parties didn't stand against you um but it was nasty and it was nasty even at the count it was you, know, you were being heckled. Horrible. It was horrible. But the thing about being an actor is that I understood that I had the mic. Nobody can hear you, mate. Sorry, I can hear you. And it was really horrible for my campaigners because they were resisting just, you know, getting, you know, very angry. Um, and afterwards, afterwards, we did ask, because they were really horrible, yelling all sorts of stuff, calling me a racist, and they were just vile. And I asked afterwards, why didn't the police intervene? But then the cameras would have had to go on them. So we just had to put up with it. All of them lost their deposit. So, but, you know, that was a great day at the office, actually. Um, you know, they lost their 500 quid. But when you looked at them or heard what they'd been saying or saw their leaflets, what, what did you feel about what they were saying and, and the community that you were trying to represent? Well, they, you know, were say, they were saying it was democracy, that they had a right to stand. But actually, Joe's murder was anti-democratic. And it just were, it, it, were, it made me incandescent with fury that they had the, the you know, that they dared to stand um, at, at, at a point when, I'm not saying sh sh a shoo-in for me, but other major parties had had the, you know, the humanity to say this isn't a by-election we're going to contest because it's nobody wanted this um, and at one point we were in the campaign office and one of the one of them came in with a cake about and on written on the cake was child grooming something about child grooming and Melanie on the MP for um, uh, Grimsby she just whipped the cake out of their hands and shoved them out it wasn't the time for that discussion and whilst of course it's something that has happened in my community and in Huddersfield and wider and across the country as something you need to discuss and you need to challenge. That's not the time for it because actually all you're trying to do is divide us. And the whole point of, of me taking over is Batley and Spen need an MP and an MP that could bring the community together. And actually, when I think about, you know, why, why me in a way, I think the community needed somebody with empathy. And as an actor, empathy is one of your tools that you need to play other people. So, uh, you know, I did spend six months crying with people and, and um, you know, listening. And it was not really a political position, certainly in the first few months. And we couldn't go on media because if we did, in the by-election, then they would have also their tuppence worth as well. So they, in order to, to moderate their exposure, I, I wasn't doing media, I was just listening to people. But how many of the people in your constituency do you think had had enough with immigration, wanted it over, thought there were too many immigrants, blamed the Pakistani community for the paedophilia that was going on, mm. the grooming? Um, you know, were these attitudes that were widespread? Are these attitudes that are widespread? Well, I would say that those, those concerns are valid, uh, but we are a community that is built on immigration. Immigration benefits communities, but also we have to understand that if a community doesn't feel, uh, if things have changed to such a point that they don't, they don't recognize their community, then of course we need to have that conversation. But the great stuff about Batley and Spen is that it is a mix um, and 
um, whilst there are, you know, there are people who want to sow that division and point the finger, absolutely immigration has been the problem of everything. It, you know, we have one of the highest rates of um, British citizenship in Yorkshire and Humber. So when people say, well, send them all home, I mean, they're all British citizens, they, whoever they are, the majority of British citizens. Um, we, so ha we have to work together, otherwise they win. Otherwise this division and this d desire to divide us, we can't allow that to happen. And, that, and I would just say that uh, Kim, Joe's sister, has been doing amazing work with Maureen Common to try and build those bridges. But do, do you think too much is done to accommodate Old racists. Old racists. Uh, if we're going to speak bluntly, you know. Well, I wouldn't say uh, there's... I, I would question who's accommodating. Um, I would say we are listening to people's um, anxieties about the future. But I would also say that the, part of the problem with the blame game is that it's setting one community up against the other when actually all of that community has suffered from austerity for the last nine years. What, what I mean is, I mean, I said old racist provocatively because that's obviously, you know, it, it's the sort There's of... no way to talk about it's, my dad. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's one criticism from, from one group of people, but it's also a sort of a, a paranoid, that's what you're calling us. You're calling us old racists um, if we have concerns about immigration. Isn't the truth that, you know, Politicians and leaders aren't calling out racism and they are saying, well, these are all legitimate concerns. Uh, whereas where some concerns might be legitimate, but some of them might just be old racism. But it's, it's also about just being vile. And actually the age of civility is dead uh, and nuance is dead. And certainly um, during the uh, referendum, that inability to understand the other and to be able to say whatever you like um, has become a free-for-all and is actually upsetting. And you just hope that there is a way that we can come together after all of the Brexit divisions. Um, I, I wouldn't say we're in, indulging um, uh, people's attitudes of... Uh, hate because it is it's also a lack of understanding about other people but how much hate is there that's what i'm trying to get mm. to really i suppose with all of this well i i would say there are tensions and i'd be a i'd be a fool to say that there aren't this is partly also about your transition into politics i suppose and and i'm wondering how many of those sort of gordon brown type moments you have you know when you when you have a conversation with a constituent who is saying things you fundamentally disagree with do you find those moments where you just want to get in the car and say it was just a bigoted old woman? Um, but you can't, obviously, because you're in politics now. I, I probably wouldn't have done anyway. Um, and I think they're my community. I think it might be different if you're from the outside, but they're my friend's granddad or my friend's auntie um, or people who've come into my surgery with genuine concerns. So I'm not saying it's all, you know, um, hearts and flowers, of course not. But there are people who are genuinely angry. Um, a fair bit of it that is directed to me is misogyny. Um, uh, and then there's a fair bit that is angry because they've had a really crap hand of cards. And they need to blame somebody. And I held a meeting with, uh, you would say, those uh, people who were very angry about Brexit. And I brought some of my South Asian councillors to the meeting and there was almost unanimous um, understanding. We need to do more of these meetings. We can't just avoid people who disagree with us. I mean, it makes me sound like I'm a completely um, uh, naive. I, I'm not. I do understand that people have genuine concerns and feel left out, and that there are there are sections um, of our community that are very traditional and are almost going backwards. You know, meeting young women who wear the veil when their mothers don't. So you, you know, those issues are. But are, are you prepared concern. to confront these on on both sides? Is what I'm saying. Are you challenging? the attitudes in your white working class community that you don't agree with? Yes, in that we are uh, having meetings and public meetings where it's not, you know, it's not what you, you, you know, it feels like anger and abuse, but actually I'm the only person in the room that can have a pop at. 
So I have had those very difficult meetings. What uh, happens when you say anger and abuse? Well, you know, there's a few fists being shaken. I'm a late arriver to the um, confirmatory vote. I've always said it's not the best of three. It's democracy, you know, 63% in Batley and Spen voted leave. Uh, we, you know, we have to find a way. 17 million, 16 million, not too far apart, find some sort of compromise. But it has been such an utter shambles. And, I mean, just... Back in the day, if you have a director who uh, doesn't have a vision for the play, you've got all your actors learning the lines and bumping into the furniture, and it's a mess. You know, we've seen no leadership whatsoever from um, from Theresa May. So, you know, I, I, I decided, actually, this is not the leave you wanted, and uh, let's see if there is an appetite to, um, you know, to remain. There was a rip in the universe and a whole heap of crap fell on my head. And people had videoed that speech where I said, I'm not in the market for a you know, second referendum and it's not the best of three. And then they feel really angry with me that I've now changed my mind and changed my opinion. Um, so why had you changed your mind? Because, I mean, do, is, the, <laughs> is there any truth to the idea that, you know, you were going along with having to deliver Brexit and opposing any... Um, attempts to to slow it down or derail it because of your you know because of a fear of losing your seat no no not losing my seat i mean i've come into this job in unusual circumstances i really don't feel i'm someone that is clinging on to this seat and will say and do anything in order to keep it if i was voted out tomorrow democratically i'd, I'd go back to act you know i'd just have to earn my living elsewhere i haven't taken this job as a career move I'm taking it to represent my community. And I had to accept that there was a majority vote for leave. And we had to understand, one, why? And I don't think there's been a proper conversation about why and how we can ensure that those people who voted to leave are heard and why did they and what can we do to make their lives better or whatever. You know, because people who voted to leave are decent people and they, want, they voted to leave because they want a better world for their children. But it's an impossible question to answer for, for you, though, isn't it? Because you're not in government. There is nothing you can do to make those people's lives better because you're an opposition MP. Well, no, there is in that I can, I can attract funding, I can bring in uh, culture is my thing. So we've had loads of great successes, lots of young people going on to things they wouldn't normally do because of the, the work that I and others have done. So I do feel I have a, a really big impact in aspiration in the arts. So that is my thing. Okay. So that's that, that part. So having, having tried very hard then to back those attempts to deliver Brexit, yeah. why are you now saying we must have a confirmatory vote? Because we're in this cul-de-sac, because we are... And it's are, no matter what, is it? No matter are, what the deal is? We are absolutely stuck. So, the, so uh, the indicative votes, for example, I voted for a number of options because I think it's really important. What can we live with? to find a creative solution to this problem. And, you know, in communities like mine, the divide and the fury that, that people, for the first time in their life, they were on the winning side. They, you know, they'd never been on the winning side. And now we're not listening. And the, the anger of that and the frustration is now leading to apathy. I'm not and quite clear, the... though, whether you're saying there must be a confirmatory vote. Well, I, I... Or not. Well... Because you, you started off saying, yes, there should yeah, be, no, and now no, you there, there seem to be backing off it. No, 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 there, there, there should be in uh, the option for a confirmatory vote. That is all, and that's been our position as well from, from, the, from the conference. I actually think we should have it. It does depend on what Labour manages to get out the Tories. Um, but I think, yeah, my position is it makes a lot of sense. What do you think of... Jeremy Corbyn's handling of this particular issue? Has it been crystal clear to you? I think it, it, it's been incredibly difficult to dance on the head of a pin um, in order to keep um, those options open for as long as they've been open. Because I know that to say right from the beginning, oh, well, you were all wrong to decide what you did. And what we want is we, we want to say we want a second referendum, but actually it's a bit sly because we just want to remain. And I think people in Yorkshire would have seen right through it. But now they have seen the complexity and the, the, the absolutely inept handling 
of the negotiations. Um, you know, I think Jeremy's tactic to try and listen to both sides of the argument has been very helpful to uh, MPs like myself and in northern towns where we could say, you know, we, are, we have heard you. What kind of threat do you think the far right poses right now? I think uh, it divides us. I think we know in Batley and Spen what the threat, the far right uh, threat is. Um, and certainly around the world, we know that intolerance um, of faith um, is, it feels almost, almost out of control. Um, and we have to put the work in to ensure that the offer that comes from the far right, which is hate and division, that we have something else to offer. Because the far right won't get you a better bus service to Clickheaton. The far right won't get you um, a, a decent education or an opportunity to go to university. You know, we have to get our message out loud and clear that the only thing it will do is create pain and division in communities. Do you live in fear? Um, I get asked this a lot, given um, how I came in. And I have to tell you, I can't because they win. And so when people say to me, you know, oh, have you got a bouncer or have you got this or got that? Oh, obviously, I'm not an idiot, but I can't allow that fear to come in because how could I do my job? I have to be the most fearless because um, of how um, Joe was taken from us. But you must have thought through the scenario. Yeah, I'm, I'm of the mind lightning doesn't strike twice. Um, I, I must say, in comparison to some MPs, I don't get a lot of abuse. Um, I think the majority of it is misogyny, particularly for women. But people are particularly angry about Brexit. I will always talk to people. It's, you know, democracy. I'm, I'm held to account. You can challenge me on my policies and my position. Uh, but then when it gets personal, you know, and they're just... I mean, I just think they're... Just very sad, you know, they're sat in their wife fronts in the mum's back bedroom eating pot noodle and they just want to have a pop. That's the majority. And then there are the very frightening minority. Um, and let's not forget that Hope Not Hate just uncovered um, the uh, attempted murder of the MP in the Northwest. So, of course, it's serious but I can't live my life like that or I can't do my job. Because you, you would have thought that in an area that saw Joe Cox murdered, the far right would be crushed by that. You know, that the people who had considered supporting these parties as a protest mm. would go, oh, we don't want that. But that's not what's happened, is it? And absolutely, I'm not complacent. You know, over a thousand people voted for those far right candidates overall. You know, those are people we need to reach out and, and get to. But it's, it's also in about your social policy and the things that you do on the ground, in the, the, the school places, the, um, the look of the high street. If you feel your high street is shabby and full of uh, betting shops and secondhand shops, you're going to feel, well, all the fun's over there somewhere and I'm not getting a slice of this. And why is that? It's because of them. We need to... Uh, ensure that the work that we do is to make them uh, make our community a better place to live more opportunities more um more joy uh, you know for your children and for you and for your families so what's your role in that well how, how are you going to change the world well the the only way i can do it is through culture so uh, my my understanding that we have talent it coalesced around the batley and spend youth theater we did a big production of les mis in oxfam's warehouse uh, nick evans a west end director donna monday west end producer brought west end talent uh, it was an extraordinary experience and not just standing ovations, but the impact on the young people and being part of Tom Watson's uh, and Gloria De Piero's uh, look at the class ceiling in the arts. I was able to say to the National Youth Theatre, you know, nobody in Batley and Spen will feel this is for them because they have to travel to London and you have to you have to live in London over the summer. You've we just don't have the money. Uh, so they came to Batley and Spen, they auditioned thousands of kids all over the country, auditioned, they take about 150, and we got nine in.
from Batley and Spen. Now, the, these young people's lives uh, will be transformed because there was a bursary for the London element and it was a free audition. A young woman has just had her play. She's 18, Alice, and her, her, I met her dad stuck in shelves in Tesco's and he, she's had her play uh, chosen out of a competition of 300 entries, professional production at the National. Lots of kids uh, have gone on to drama schools. I absolutely believe, you, you know, try, working with the GMB on Shakespeare for Workers, that culture can bring a sense of place and belonging and a, a sense of... Um, uh, you know, a positive energy to a community because it cannot be that you have to leave home to do the things you want to do. This is all I can do. You know, Jo was an extraordinary uh, woman and her experience in Darfur and Oxfam, you know, she brought that to the role. The only thing I, well, you know, the thing I've got is 35 years in the arts and there's nobody in the building in Parliament with that experience. So building on that and saying, you know, we ha we have not just talent, but these are jobs and potential for regeneration for our communities. Um, nobody else is saying it. I also like to ask everybody, if you were in charge now, um, what you would do, how you would change the world. Do you have a sort of a, a dream vision of the world? I suspect you do because you've been so political for so long. Yeah. You it, know, if you were suddenly in charge, what would you do? Can I have two? Two back yeah. to Cherry. Uh, education the EBAC and the teaching to the test, reducing that creative cultural offer for schools and for young people, and even in the early years, is absolutely heartbreaking because I hadn't understood how little was being offered and how, you know, we're losing drama teachers, art teachers, teachers are expected to do more music and now can you do photography now can you do dt you know overstretched teachers we have to reverse that we have to say uh actually surely part of this e-back has got to be creative creative subjects because all those people who pay the thousands of pounds for their kids to go to um you know the eatons of this world they've got three theaters and a technician they know why that you know what they want is an enriched young person and those subjects are part of enrichment and articulacy and confidence and you know be a, a, an ability to talk about your ideas because in the future that's what's going to that's what we is what we're going to need we're going to need people who can talk about ideas and talk about change and how to get things done so and also just thinking because i knew you were going to ask me this question so thinking about this on the way that the BBC is an amazing organisation from, you know, local radio through to the iPlayer, through to Bite Size. But it's interesting when we're talking about democracy, that uh, how about we have an elected director general? It, you know, we pay our, we pay our um, licence fee and the reach of the BBC is so great. And maybe that would be a way that we could get a woman, DG. You might get Nigel Farage. Um, well, I think when he's... <laughs> when, well, who knows? It seems to be in elections. Anything could happen. But uh, I think it's a potential for change right there. But I think culture should be at the heart of everything we do. Tracy Raven, thank you very much indeed.